And Quiet Flows the Dawn, Part 2, by Mikhail Sholokhov, Continued. Evidently they were reluctant to, knowing that his roads ran counter to those of the village, and whether they would run together again was uncertain. The huts to which the Cossacks returned as masters or expected guests were filled with rejoicing. The rejoicing was emphasized more sharply and ruthlessly by the deep misery of those who had lost their relatives and dear ones forever. There were many Cossacks missing, scattered over the fields of Galicia, the Bukovina, eastern Prussia, the Carpathians, Romania, their bodies lying and rotting under the gunfire dirge. And now the hillocks of the brotherly graves were overgrown with vegetation. Rain pressed down on them, and the drifting snow enwrapped them. No matter how often the straight-haired Cossack women ran to the corner and gazed under their palms, they would never live to see their dear ones come riding home. No matter how much the tears streamed from their swollen and faded eyes, they could not wash away the pain. No matter how much they cried on the anniversaries and remembrance days, the eastern wind would not carry their cries to Galicia and eastern Prussia, to the grass-grown hillocks of the brotherly graves. The grass grows over the graves, time overgrows the pain. The wind blew away the traces of those who had departed. Time blows away the bloody pain and the memory of those who did not live to see their dear ones again, and will not live, for brief is human life, and not for long is any of us granted to tread the grass. The wife of Prochor Shamil beat her head against the hard ground and chewed the earthen floor of her hut with her teeth as she saw her brother-in-law, Martin Shamil, caressing his pregnant wife or giving his children presents and dandling them. She writhed and crawled on hands and knees over the floor, whilst around her her little children clung like a drove of sheep, howling as they watched their mother, their eyes dilated with fear. Tear the collar of your last shirt at your throat, dear heart. Tear the hair of your head, thin with your joyless heavy life. Bite your lips till the blood comes, Wring your work-scarred hands and beat yourself against the floor on the threshold of your empty hut. The master is missing from your hut. Your husband is missing. Your children are fatherless. And remember that no one will caress you or your orphans. No one will press your head to his breast at night when you drop worn out with weariness. And no one will say to you as once he said, Don't worry, Aniska. We'll manage somehow. You will not get another husband, for labor, anxieties, children have withered you and lined you. No father will come for your half-naked, sniveling children. You yourself will have to do all the plowing, the dragging, panting with the overgreat strain. You will have to pitchfork the sheaves from the reaper, to throw them onto the wagon, to raise the heavy bundles of wheat on the pitchfork feeling the while that something is rending beneath your belly. And afterwards, you will writhe with pain, covering yourself with your rags and issuing with blood. As Alexei Byeshnyak's mother turned over his old underwear, she wept bitter tears as she sniffed at them. But only in the folds of his last shirt, brought back by Misha Kashavoy, could she smell the traces of his sweat. Dropping her head onto it, the old woman rocked and lamented grievously, soiling the stained and dirty cotton shirt with her tears. The families of Manitskov, Ozhirov, Kalinin, Likhovidov, Yermakov, and many other Cossacks were orphaned. Only for Stepan Astakhov did no one weep, for there was no one. His boarded-up hut, tumbled down and gloomy even in summertime, was left empty. Aksinya lived in Yagodnoya, and little was heard of her. She never set foot in the village and had no inclination towards it. The Cossacks of the upper districts of the Don returned home in local waves. By December, almost all had returned to the village of Vyshenska district. Day and night, the bands of riders passed through Tatarsk in groups of from ten to forty, making their way to the left bank of the Don. Where are you from, soldiers? The old men would go out and ask. 
from Chonaryechka, from Zimovna, from Dubrovka, from Garachovska, would come the replies. Finishing fighting, then? an old man would ask with a sneer. Some of the riders, more honest and peaceable, would reply, We've had enough, Daddy. We've finished. But the more desperate and evil would curse and advise the old men, Go home, old men, and mind your own business. What are you asking for? There are too many of you busybodies about. By the end of the winter, the beginnings of civil war had broken out close to Novicherkas, but in the villages in the upper district of the Don reigned a graveyard silence. Only an internal hidden dissension raged in the huts, and sometimes broke through to the surface. The old men could not get on with the Cossacks returned from the front. Of the war which was raging close to the capital of the Don province, they knew only by hearsay, only hazily understanding the various political tendencies that had arisen, they waited on event, listening attentively. Until January, life flowed quietly in the village of Tatarsk. The Cossacks who had returned from the front rested at the sides of their wives and ate their fill, little wrecking that still more bitter woes and burdens than those that they had had to bear during the war were on guard at the threshold of their huts. Chapter 9 In January 1917, Grigor Myelikov was promoted to officer's rank in recognition of his distinguished services in the field and was appointed to the 2nd Reserve Regiment as a troop commander. In the following September, he went home on leave after an illness with inflammation of the lungs. He spent six weeks at home, then was passed as fit by the District Medical Commission and returned to his regiment. After the November Revolution, he was promoted to the rank of company commander. About this time, his opinions underwent a considerable change as the result of the events occurring around him and the influence of one of the officers in the regiment, Captain Yefim Izvarin. Grigor made Izvarin's acquaintance the day he returned from leave and afterwards met him frequently, both on and off duty. Yefim Izvarin was the son of a well-to-do Cossack, he had been educated in the Novicherkas Junkers Training College, went straight from college to the 10th Don Cossack Regiment at the front, served in this regiment for about a year, received the Cross of St. George and 14 pieces of hand grenade in various convenient and inconvenient parts of his body, and was then transferred to the 2nd Reserve Regiment. A man of many abilities, highly talented, educated considerably above the level of the average Cossack officer, Izvarin was a fervent Cossack nationalist. The March Revolution afforded him opportunities for development. He associated with Cossack separationist circles and carried on an intelligent agitation for the complete autonomy of the Don region and the establishment of the form of government which had existed before the enslavement of the Cossacks by Great Russia. He was well acquainted with history, was ardent yet clear-sighted and sober in intellect, and with compelling eloquence painted a picture of the future free life of the Don Cossacks when they would have their own government, when there would not be a Russian left in the province, and the Cossackry, setting guards along their own frontiers, would talk as equals, without any cap-raising, with the Ukraine and Great Russia, and carry on commerce and exchange with them. Izvarin turned the heads of the simple-minded Cossacks and the poorly educated officers, and Grigor also fell under his spell. At first, heated arguments went on between them, but the half-educated Grigor was no match for his opponent, and Izvarin easily triumphed in the verbal duels. The discussion usually took place in some corner of the barracks, and the listeners were always on Izvarin's side. He impressed the Cossacks with his views, touching their innermost, deeply cherished feelings. But how shall we be able to live without Russia when we've got nothing except wheat? Grigor would ask. Izvarin would patiently explain. I am not thinking of an independent and completely isolated existence for just the Don region. We shall live together with the Kuban, the Tyeriek, and the mountaineers of the Caucasus on the basis of federation, that is, association. The Caucasus is rich in minerals. You can find everything there. And coal, too? The Don Basin is right to our hands. But it belongs to Russia. Whom it belongs to, 
and on whose territory it is, is a matter of dispute. But even if the Don Basin goes to Russia, we shall lose very little. Our federative alliance will not be based on industry. We are an agrarian country, and as that is so, we shall supply our small industry with coal bought from Russia, and not only from Russia, timber, metal articles, and so on, and in return we shall supply them with good quality wheat and oil. And what advantage shall we get by being separate? That's simple. In the first place, we shall be free from their political protection. We shall restore the order destroyed by the Russian Tsars and turn out all the foreigners. Within ten years, by importing machinery, we shall raise our agriculture to such a level that we shall be ten times as rich. The land is ours. It was washed with our father's blood and fertilized with their bones. But for four hundred years we have been in subjection to Russia, defending her interests and not thinking of ourselves. We have a way out to the sea. We shall have a strong fighting army, and neither the Ukraine nor even Russia will dare to violate our independence. Life will be like a fairy tale then. Izvarin, with his average height, handsome figure and broad shoulders, was a typical Cossack. He had curly hair the color of unripened oats, a swarthy face, a white, receding forehead, and was sunburnt only on his cheeks and along his bleached eyebrows. He spoke in a high, flexible, tenor voice, and when talking, had a habit of suddenly raising his left eyebrow and wrinkling his hooked nose, so that he seemed to be sniffing at something. His energetic walk, self-confident carriage, and the open gaze of his black eyes marked him out from the other officers of the regiment. The Cossacks had a frank respect for him, more perhaps than for the regimental commander himself. He and Grigor had long talks together, and Grigor, feeling that the ground was quaking beneath his feet, passed through an experience similar to that in the hospital at Moscow when he met Garanja. He compared the words of Izvarin and Garanja and tried to decide where the truth was to be found but he could not. Nevertheless, almost involuntarily and subconsciously, he adopted the new faith. Shortly after the November Revolution, he had a long conversation with Izvarin. Torn by contradictory impulses, he cautiously asked the captain what he thought of the Bolsheviks. Tell me, Yefim Ivanich, he said, do you think the Bolsheviks are right or not? Raising his eyebrows and humorously crinkling his nose, Izvarin replied, are the Bolsheviks right? <laughs> My boy, you're like a newborn babe. The Bolsheviks have their own program, their own plans and hopes. They are right from their point of view, and we are right from ours. Do you know the real name of the Bolsheviks' party? No? It is the Russian Social Democratic Workers' Party. Understand? Workers. They're flirting now with the peasantry and the Cossacks, but the working class is their basis. They are bringing emancipation to the workers, but perhaps even worse enslavement to the peasants. In real life, it never works out that everybody gets an equal share. If the Bolsheviks get the upper hand, it will be good for the workers and bad for the rest. If the monarchy returns, it will be good for the landowners and such like and bad for the rest. We don't want either the one or the other. We need our own. And first of all, we need to get rid of all our protectors, whether Karnilov or Kerensky or Lenin, God save us from our friends, and we'll manage our enemies ourselves. But you know, the majority of the Cossacks are drawn towards the Bolsheviks. Gryagor, my friend, understand this, for it is fundamental. At the moment, the roads of the peasants and the Cossacks coincide with that of the Bolsheviks. That's true. But do you know why? It is because the Bolsheviks stand for peace, for an immediate peace. And at the moment, this is where the Cossacks feel the war. He gave himself a sounding slap on his swarthy neck, and straightening his lifted eyebrow, shouted, And that is why the Cossacks are reeking with Bolshevism, and are going step by step with the Bolsheviks. But, as soon as the war is over, and the Bolsheviks stretch out their hands to touch the Cossacks' possessions, the roads of the Cossacks and the Bolsheviks will part. That is basic and historically inevitable. Between the present order of Cossack existence and socialism, which is the final consummation of the Bolshevik Revolution, there is an uncrossable Rubicon, an abyss. Well, what do you say to that? I say that I don't understand it. 
Gregor mumbled. It's hard for me to make head or tail of it. I'm all over the place, like drifting snow in the steppe. You won't get out of it like that. Life itself will force you to make something of it and will drive you to one side or the other. Isvarin clinched his argument. This conversation took place at the beginning of November. Later in the same month, Grigor happened to meet another Cossack who played a large part in the history of the revolution in the dawn. A freezing rain had been falling since midday. Towards evening, the weather cleared, and Grigor decided to call on Drozdov, a subaltern of the 28th Regiment who came from his own district. He found Drozdov had company, a healthy, sturdy Cossack with the epaulets of a sergeant major in the guard's battery was sitting on the camp bed with his back to the window. He sat with bowed back, his legs in their black cloth trousers set widely apart, his large, hairy hands resting on his broad knees. His tunic fitted him tightly and was rucked up under the arms. At the scrape of the door, he turned his short neck, stared coldly at Gregor, and dropped his puffy eyelids over the chilly light of his eyes. Let me introduce you to each other. Gregor, this is Padzielkov from Ustkopiersk. Almost a neighbor of ours, said Drozdov. The two men silently shook hands, and Gregor sat down. He offered his new acquaintance a cigarette. Podsielkov fumbled a long time with his great red fingers at the closely packed case, flushing with confusion and cursing in his vexation. Finally, he managed to pick out a cigarette and raised his smiling eyes to Gregor's face. His easy manner pleased Gregor, who asked, What village are you from? I was born in Krutovsky, but I've recently been living in Ustklinovsky. You've heard of Krutovsky, I expect. Podzielkov's face was slightly pockmarked. His whiskers were twisted tightly. His hair was plastered down over his little ears and raised elegantly over his left eyebrow. He would have made a pleasant impression, but for his large, upturned nose and his eyes. At first glance, there was nothing extraordinary about his eyes, but as he looked more closely... Gregor almost felt their leaden heaviness. Small like grape shot, they gleamed through narrow slits as though out of embrasures, and fastened their gaze on one spot with a heavy, cadaverous obstinacy. Gregor stared at the man curiously, noting one characteristic feature. Podjelkov almost never blinked. As he talked, he fixed his cheerless gaze on his audience, or shifted his glance from object to object, but all the time his curly, sun-bleached eyelashes were drooped and motionless. Only occasionally did he drop his puffy eyelids and suddenly raise them again. Here's an interesting point, brothers, Grigor opened the conversation. The war will end and we shall begin to live again. The Ukraine will have a separate government and the military council will rule in the dawn. You mean Ottoman Kalyedin, Podjelkov quietly corrected him. It's all the same. What's the difference? Oh, there's no difference, Podzielkov agreed. We've said goodbye to Mother Russia, Grigor continued his paraphrase of Izvarin's argument, curious to see how Drozdov and the stranger from the guard's battery reacted to these ideas. We shall have our own government and our own style of life. Out with the Ukrainians from the Cossack lands. We'll establish frontier guards and keep the Chacholes out. We shall live as our forefathers lived in the old days. I think the revolution is all to our good. What is your opinion, Drozdov? Drozdov smiled ingratiatingly. Of course it will be better for us, he replied. The peasants robbed us of our strength, and we couldn't live under them. And all the Ottomans were German. Von Trauba, von Graba, and the devil knows what else. They gave our land to all these staff officers. Now we shall get time to breathe at any rate. But will Russia agree to all this? Podzielkov quietly asked of no one in particular. She'll have to, Grigor assured him. In any case, it will be just the same, the same old soup, only thicker. How do you make that out? Of course it will, Podzielkov shifted his tiny eyes more swiftly and threw a heavy glance at Grigor. The Ottomans will go on just the same as before, oppressing the people who have to work. You will go before some excellency, and he'll give you one in the snout. A fine life indeed. A millstone round the neck and nothing else. Grigor rose and began to pace up and down the room. 
Finally, he halted in front of Podsielkov and asked, Then what are we to do? Go on to the end. To what end? Once you've started plowing, you must furrow on to the end. Once you've overthrown the Tsar and the counter-revolution, you must work for the government to pass into the hands of the people. That story about the old times is all fairy tales. In the old days, the Tsars oppressed us, and now if the Tsars don't, somebody else will. Then what is your way out, Podchelkov? A people's government, elected. If you get into the hands of the generals, there will be war again, and we can do without that. If only we could get a people's government set up all over the world so that the people were not oppressed and we didn't have war. But what have we got now? If you turn a pair of old trousers inside out, you're still left with the holes. We'd better keep free of the old days, or they'll be harnessing us up so that we shall be worse off than under the Tsar. Grigor clutched at the air with his hands and asked in a mournful voice, Are we to give up our land, divide it up among everybody? No, why should we? Podchelkov seemed confused and embarrassed by the question. We shan't give up our land. We shall divide it up among ourselves, among the Cossacks, first taking the landowner's land away from them. But we mustn't give any to the peasants, their whole coat to our sleeve. Once we start dividing it with them, they'll beggar us. And who will govern us? We shall govern ourselves, Podchelkov replied more animatedly. We shall have our own government. Only let the Kalyadins loosen the saddle girths a little, and we shall soon throw them off our backs. Grigor halted before the steaming window and stared out into the street at children playing some game, at the wet roofs of the houses opposite, at the pale gray branches of a bare poplar in the fence, and listened no more to the argument between Podchelkov and Drozhdov. He was struggling painfully to see daylight through the jumble of thoughts oppressing him, so come to some decision. For some ten minutes he stood drawing initials with his finger on the window glass. Beyond the window the faded early winter sunset was smoldering on a level with the roof of the low house opposite. The sun hung as though set edgeways on the rusty crown of the roof and about to roll down on one or the other side. Rustling leaves came chasing along the street from the town garden, and the strong wind blowing from the Ukraine raided the town again and again. Part 4 Civil War Chapter 1 The town of Novocherkass became the center of attraction for all who had fled from the Bolshevik Revolution. Important generals who formerly had been arbiters of the destiny of the Russian armies poured down into the lower regions of the Don, hoping to find support for their activities among the reactionary Don Cossacks and to develop an offensive against Sovietized Russia. On November 15th, General Alexeyev arrived in the town. After talks with Kalyedin, he set to work to organize volunteer detachments. The backbone of the future volunteer army was provided by officers, Junkers, and others who had fled from the north. Within three weeks, an unwholesome flesh had grown around this thin framework, consisting of students, soldiers, the most active of the counter-revolutionary Cossacks, and men seeking adventure and higher pay, even in Kerensky rubles. At the beginning of December, more generals arrived, and on December 19th, Kornilov himself appeared in the town. By this time, Kalyedin had succeeded in withdrawing almost all the Cossack regiments from the Romanian and Austro-German fronts, and had distributed them among the main railway lines of the Don province. But the Cossacks, wearied with three years of war, and returning from the front in a revolutionary mood, showed no great desire to fight the Bolsheviks. The regiments were left with hardly a third of their normal complement, for the home fires beckoned powerfully, and there was no power on earth that could have restrained the Cossacks from their elemental movement homeward. When Kalyedin made a first attempt in December to send front-line detachments against revolutionary Rostov, the Cossacks refused to attack, and turned back after going a little distance. But the widely developed organization for consolidating the fragmentary divisions began to have its results. By the middle of December, Kalyedin had several reliable volunteer detachments at his command. 
but from three sides columns of red guards were approaching the province. In Kharkov and Varanyej, forces were being assembled to strike a blow against the counter-revolutionaries in the dawn. Clouds hung and deepened and blackened over the dawn. The winds from the Ukraine were already bringing the sound of the gun thunder accompanying the first clashes. Gloomy days were coming to the dawn. An evil time was approaching. Yellow-white billowing clouds were floating slowly over Novichirkas. In the height of the heaven, right above the glittering dome of the cathedral, a gray, fluffy crawl of feathery cloud hung in an expanse of cloudless blue, its long tail drooping and gleaming a rosy silver. One morning in November, Ilya Bunchuk arrived at Novichirkas by the Moscow train. He was the last to leave the carriage, pulling down the edges of his old overcoat and feeling a little awkward and strange in his civilian clothing. He went out into the town, carrying his cheap, shabby suitcase under his arm. He met hardly anyone along the whole of the road, although he crossed the town from one side to the other. After half an hour's walk, he halted before a small, dilapidated house. It had not been repaired for years. Time had set its hands upon it, and the roof was sinking. The walls were awry, the shutters hung loosely, and the windows squinted. As he opened the wicket gate, Bunchuk ran his eyes over the house and the tiny yard. Then he hurried up the steps. He found half the narrow corridor of the house occupied by a chest piled with lumber. In the darkness, he knocked his knee against one corner, but threw open the door, not feeling the pain. There was no one in the first low room. He went towards the second, halting on the threshold. His head swam with the terribly familiar scent peculiar to this one house. His eyes took in all the room, the icon in the corner, the bed, the table, the small speckled mirror above it, some photographs, several rickety chairs, a sewing machine, and a tarnished samovar standing on the stove. With heart suddenly, violently beating, he threw down his suitcase and stared around the kitchen. The tall, green-washed stove had a welcoming look. From behind a blue cotton curtain peeped an old tabby cat, its eyes gleaming with almost human curiosity. An unwashed utensil lay untidily on the table, and a ball of wool and four gleaming knitting needles carrying an unfinished stocking had been left on a stool. He ran out under the steps. From the door of a shed in the far corner of the yard emerged an old, bowed woman. Mother! But is it? Is it she? His lips trembling, he ran to meet her, tearing the cap from his head as he went. What do you want? The old woman asked cautiously, standing with her palm shading her eyes. Mother! The words burst hoarsely from Bunchuk's throat. Don't you know me? He went stumbling towards her and saw her sway at his shout as though before a blow. She wanted to run, but her strength failed her, and she came in little spurts, as though battling against a wind. He caught her in his arms. He kissed her furrowed face and her eyes, dull with fear and gladness, while his own eyes blinked helplessly. Ilya, Ilyusha, my little son, I didn't know you. Lord, where have you come from? the old woman whispered. They went into the house. He threw off his overcoat with a sigh of relief and sat down at the table. I never thought I should see you again. It's so many years. My dear, how could I know you when you had grown so much and looked so much older, she said. Well, but how are you, mother, he asked with a smile. As she disconnectedly replied, she bustled about, clearing the table, putting charcoal into the samovar. With streaming eyes, she ran back again and again to her son to stroke his head and press him to her. She boiled water and gave him a meal, herself washed his head, took some clean underwear, yellow with age, from the bottom of the chest, and sat until midnight with her eyes fixed on him, questioning him and bitterly shaking her head. Two o'clock had just struck in the neighboring belfry when Bunchuk lay down to sleep. He dropped off at once and dreamed that he was once more a pupil at the craft school, tired out with play and dozing over his books, while his mother opened the door from the kitchen and asked sternly, Ilya, have you learned your lessons for tomorrow? 
He slept with a fixed, tensely happy smile on his face. His mother went to him more than once during the night, straightening the blanket and pillow, kissing his great forehead, and quietly going out again. He spent only one day at home. In the morning, a comrade in a soldier's greatcoat came and talked with him in undertones. After the man had gone, he bustled about, swiftly packed his suitcase, and drew on his ill-fitting overcoat. He took a hurried farewell of his mother, promising to see her again within a month. "'Where are you off to now, Ilya? she asked. "'To Rostov, mother. To Rostov. I'll be back soon. Don't you fret, mother, don't fret,' he cheered her. She hurriedly removed a small cross from her neck, and as she kissed her son, she slipped the string over his head. As with trembling fingers she adjusted it around his neck, she whispered, "'Wear this, Ilya. Defend him and save him, Lord. Cover him with thy wings. He is all I have in the world.' As she passionately embraced him, she could not control herself, and the corners of her lips quivered and drooped bitterly. Like spring rain, one warm tear after another fell onto Bunchuk's hairy hand. He unfastened her hands from his neck and ran with clouded face out of the house. The crowd was packed like sardines at Rostov Station, and the floors were littered ankle-deep with cigarette ends and the husks of sunflower seeds. On the station square, the soldiers from the town garrison were trading their equipment, tobacco, and articles they had stolen. A swarming throng of the many nationalities to be found in the southern seaport towns moved slowly about. Bunchuk pressed through the crowd, sought out the party committee room, and made his way upstairs to the first floor. His further progress was barred by a red guard armed with a rifle of Japanese pattern. A knife was tied to its barrel instead of a bayonet. What do you want, comrade? the guard asked. I want comrade Abramson. Is he here? third room on the left. Bunchuk opened the door of the room indicated and found a short, big-nosed, black-haired man talking to an elderly railway man. His left hand was thrust into his jacket, his right waved methodically in the air. That's not good enough, the black-haired man was declaring. That isn't organization. If you carry on your agitation like this, you'll get exactly opposite results to those we want. Judging from the anxiously guilty look on the railwayman's face, he wanted to say something in justification, but the other man would not let him open his mouth. Evidently irritated to the last degree, he shouted, Remove Mitchenko from the work at once. This is not to be endured. We cannot allow what is going on among you. Vierkovetsky will have to answer for it to the Revolutionary Tribunal. Is he arrested? Yes. I shall insist on his being shot, he ended harshly. Still not completely in control of himself, he turned his angry face in Bunchuk's direction and asked sharply, What do you want? Are you Comrade Abramson? Bunchuk asked. Yes. Bunchuk handed him documents from the Petrograd Party Committee and sat down on the window ledge. Abramson carefully read the letters, then said, smiling morosely, Wait a bit. We'll have a talk in a moment or two. He dismissed the railwayman and went out, returning a few minutes later with a well-built, clean-shaven, non-commissioned officer bearing the mark of a saber cut across his lower jaw. This is a member of our military revolutionary committee, Abramson said to Bunchuk. And you, comrade Bunchuk, are a machine gunner, aren't you? Yes. You're just the man we're wanting, the non-commissioned officer smiled. Can you organize machine gun detachments from the worker red guards for us as soon as possible, Abramson asked. I'll try. It's a question of time. Well, how long do you need? A week? Two? Three? Smiling expectantly, the other man bent towards Bunchuk. Several days. Excellent. Abramson rubbed his forehead and said with obvious annoyance, Part of the town garrison is badly demoralized, and they are not to be relied on. Like everything else, I suppose, comrade Bunchuk, our hopes here are in the workers. The sailors, too, but as for the soldiers... He tugged at his beard and asked, How are you off in regard to supplies? Well, we'll arrange that. Have you had anything to eat today? No, of course not. You must have starved a bit in your time, brother, if you can tell at a glance whether a man is full or hungry, Bunchuk thought. As he went with a guide to Abramson's room, his mind still turned on him. 
He's a brave lad. He's a true Bolshevik. Hard, yet there's something good and human in him. He doesn't think twice about the death sentence for some sabotager, yet he can see to the needs of his comrades. Still under the warm impression of his meeting, he reached Abramson's quarters and had some dinner, then lay down to rest on the bed in the little book-filled room. He fell straight off to sleep. For the next four days, Bunchuk was occupied from early morning till nightfall with the workers assigned to him by the party committee. There were sixteen altogether, men of the most varied peacetime occupations, ages, and even nationalities. There were two stevedores, a Ukrainian named Khvilichko and a Russianized Greek, Mikhalidze, a compositor, Stepanov, eight metal workers, a miner, Zelenkov, from the Paramonov mines, a weak-looking Armenian baker, Gevorkans, a Russianized German and skilled locksmith named Rebinder, and two workers from the railway workshops. A seventeenth requisition was brought to Bunchuk by a woman attired in a padded soldier's greatcoat and boots too large for her feet. As he took the sealed letter from her, he asked, On your way back, can you call at the staff for me? She smiled, embarrassedly tidied a thick lock of hair that had fallen below her kerchief, and replied nervously, I have been sent to you. Then, overcoming her momentary confusion, she added, as a machine gunner. Bunchuk flushed heavily. Have they gone out of their minds? Is it a woman's battalion I've got to organize? Excuse me, but this isn't fit work for you. It's heavy and calls for a man's strength. No, I can't accept you. Still frowning, he opened the letter and hurriedly scanned its contents. The requisition itself merely stated that the party member, Anna Pogutko, had been assigned to the machine gun section but attached to it was a letter from Abramson, which read, Dear Comrade Bunchuk, We are sending you a good comrade in Anna Pogudko. We have yielded to her insistent demand and hope that you will make a fighting machine gunner of her. I know the girl. I can warmly recommend her. She is a valuable worker, and I ask you only to watch one thing. She is fiery and a little exalted in temperament. She hasn't yet outgrown her youth. Keep her from thoughtless actions and look after her. Speed up the training. We hear that Kalyedin is preparing to attack us. With comradely greeting, Abramson. Bunchuk stared at the girl standing before him. The dim light of the cellar, which had been allotted to him for headquarters, shadowed her face and concealed its lines. Oh, well, he said ungraciously. If it's your own wish and Abramson asks, you can stop. They crowded around the machine gun, hung in clusters over it, leaning on one another's backs and watching with inquisitive eyes as under Bunchuk's skillful hands it came to pieces. Then he reassembled it, explaining the nature and function of each section, showing them how to handle it, to load it, sight it, determine the trajectory and the range. Then he showed them how to protect themselves from the enemy fire, pointed out the necessity of setting up the gun at a point of vantage, and of arranging the ammunition cases correctly. All seventeen learnt quickly, with the exception of the baker, Gevorkians. No matter how many times Bunchuk showed him, he could not remember, and he lost his head, muttering in his confusion, Why doesn't it come out right? Oh, I'm a fool. This bit ought to be there. And now it isn't right, he cried in despair. Why isn't it? This is why, the swarthy Bogavoy imitated his tone, it doesn't come right because you're stupid. That's how it goes. He confidently put the section in its proper place. He's extraordinarily stupid, the phlegmatic German Rebinder agreed. Only Stepanov shouted with annoyance, his face flushing. You ought to show your comrade and not snarl at him. He was supported by Krutogorov, a great big-limbed worker from the railway workshops. You stand there laughing, you fools, and the work can wait. Comrade Bunchuk, instruct your waxwork gallery or else send them packing. The revolution is in danger and they stand there laughing. And they're party men, too, he waved his sledgehammer fist. Anna Pogudko inquired about everything with keen curiosity. She attached herself importunately to Bunchuk, seized his sleeve, 
and could not be displaced from the side of the machine gun. And what would happen if the water were to freeze in the water jacket? What deviation has to be allowed for in a strong wind? She plied him with questions, expectantly raising her black eyes to him. In her presence he felt awkward, and as though in revenge he grew more exacting in regard to her, and was exaggeratedly cool in his manner. But when, each morning, punctually at seven, she entered the cellar, her hands thrust into the sleeves of her jacket, the soles of her great soldier's boots shuffling, he was troubled with an unusual agitating feeling. She was rather shorter than he, of a full, healthy figure, perhaps a little round-shouldered and not particularly beautiful except for her great strong eyes, which endowed all her face with a wild beauty. During the first four days, he hardly had an opportunity to look at her. The cellar was badly lighted, and even if he had had time to study her face, he would have felt too uncomfortable to do so. On the evening of the fifth day, they left together. She went in front, but as she stood on the topmost step, she turned back to him with some query. She stood waiting for the answer, her head slightly tilted, her eyes bent on him, her hand brushing back her hair. But he did not catch her question. He slowly mounted the stairs, gripped by a pleasantly painful feeling. He knew it well. He had experienced its prick at all important turns in his life. Now he felt it again, as he stared at the swarthily rosy cheeks of this girl, at the June azure and the whites of her eyes, and the bottomless depths of her black irises. She found it difficult to adjust her hair without removing her kerchief, and in her concentration her rosy nostrils quivered a little. The lines of her mouth were strong, yet childishly tender. On her raised upper lip there was a fine down which showed dark against her skin. As simple as a fairy story, she stood before him, holding her hairpins in her silvery white teeth, her arched brow quivering, and it seemed that she would melt away like a sound at dawn in a pine wood. A wave of rapture and heavy joy carried Bunchuk away. He bowed his head as though before a blow and said half seriously, half in jest, Anna Pogudko, you're as good as someone's happiness. Nonsense, she said firmly and smiled. Nonsense, Comrade Bunchuk. I was asking at what time we go to the shooting practice tomorrow. Her smile made her appear more simple, approachable, and earthly. He stopped at her side, gazing abstractedly down the street to where the stranded sun was flooding everything with a livid hue. He quietly replied, Tomorrow at eight. Which way do you go? Where do you live? She mentioned the name of some little street on the outskirts of the town. They went together, walking for some distance without speaking. At last she gave him a sidelong glance and asked, Are you a Cossack? And Quiet Flows the Dawn, Part 2, by Mikhail Sholokhov, continued. At last she gave him a sidelong glance and asked, Are you a Cossack? Yes. And you've been an officer? Me, an officer? What is your native district? Novacherkass. How long have you been in Rostov? Several days. And before that? I was in Petrograd. When did you join the party? In 1913. And where is your family? In Novichirkas, he said hurriedly, and imploringly stretched out his hand. Stop a bit, and let me do some questioning now. Were you born in Rostov? No. I was born in Yekaterinoslav province, but I have lived here for some time. Are you a Ukrainian? She hesitated for a moment, then firmly replied, No. A Jewess? Yes. But how did you know? Do I talk like one? No. Then how did you guess I was a Jewess? He reduced the length of his stride in an attempt to fall into step with her and answered, Your ear, the shape of your ears and your eyes. Otherwise, you show little sign of your nationality. He thought for a moment, then added, It's good that you're with us. Why? she asked inquisitively. 
Well, the Jews have a certain reputation, and I know that many workers believe it to be true. You see, I am a worker too, that the Jews only do all the ordering and never go under fire themselves. That is not true, and you will prove splendidly that it isn't true. They walked slowly. She deliberately took a longer way home, and after telling him a little more about herself, began to question him again about the Karnilov attack, the attitude of the Petrograd workers, and the November Revolution. From somewhere on the keys came the sound of a rifle shot, then a machine gun disturbed the silence. She at once asked him, What make is that? A Lewis. How much of the belt has been used? He did not reply. He was admiring the orange feeler of a searchlight stretching from an anchored trawler into the height of a flaming evening sky. They wandered about the deserted town for some three hours and separated at last at the gate of her dwelling. He returned home, glowing with an inward satisfaction. She's a fine comrade and an intelligent girl. It was good to have a talk with her. I've grown boorish during these last years, and friendly intercourse with people is necessary. Otherwise one gets as worm-eaten as soldiers' biscuits, he thought, deliberately deceiving himself. Abramson, just returned from a session of the Military Revolutionary Committee, began to question him about the training of the machine-gun detachments, and asked about Anna. How is she getting on? If she isn't suitable, we can easily put her onto other work, he said. Oh, no, Bunchuk took alarm. She's a very capable girl. He felt an almost irresistible desire to go on talking about her, and mastered his inclination, only with a great effort of his will. On December 8th, Kalyedin began to fling troops into an attack upon Rostov. Thin chains of Alexeyev's officers' detachment moved along the railway line, supported on the right flank by a denser body of Junkers, and on the left by partisans of Popov's detachment. The line of Red Guards, scattered around the outskirts of the town, was possessed with restless anxiety. Some of the workers, many of whom had rifles in their hands for the first time in their lives, were terror-stricken and pressed close to the muddy ground, whilst others raised their heads and stared at the distant tiny figures of the oncoming whites. Unable to endure the tense silence, the Red Guards opened fire without waiting for the word of command. When the first shot rang out, Bunchuk, kneeling at the side of his machine gun, cursed, jumped to his feet and shouted, Cease fire! His cry was lashed by the sputter of shots. He waved his hand, tried to outshout the firing, and ordered Bagavoy to open fire with the machine gun. Bagavoy set his smiling, muddy face close to the breech and put his hand on the firing lever. The familiar sound of the spurting machine-gun bullets penetrated Bunchuk's ears. He stared in the direction of the enemy, attempting to determine the accuracy of the range, then ran along the line towards the other machine-guns. Fire! he shouted. Right ho! Ho 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 ho! Kvilichko howled, turning a frightened but happy face towards him. The third machine-gun from the center was manned by not altogether reliable elements. Bunchuk ran towards it. He stopped halfway and, bending, stared through his glasses. He could clearly see the spurting gray mounds cast up by the bullets in the distance. He lay down and assured himself that the range of the third machine gun was hopelessly inaccurate. Lower, you devils, he cried, crawling along the line. Bullets whistled close above him. The enemy was firing as perfectly as if at exercise. The gun muzzle was tilted at a ridiculous angle. Around it, the gunners lay on top of one another. The Greek, Michalidze, was firing without pause, uselessly expending all of his reserves of ammunition. Close to him was the terrified Stepanov, and behind, with head thrust into the ground and back humped like a tortoise, was one of the railway men. Thrusting Michalidze aside, Bunchuk took long and careful sight. When the bullets began to spurt once more from the gun, they immediately had effect. A group of Junkers, who had been coming on at a run, turned and fled back down the slope, leaving one of their number on the clayey ground. Handing the machine gun over, Bunchuk returned to his own gun and found Bugavoy lying on his side, cursing and binding up a wound in his leg. Rebinder, 
had taken his place and was firing intelligently and economically without a trace of excitement. From the left flank, Gevorkyans came leaping like a hare, dropping at every shot that passed over his head, groaning and shouting, I can't! I can't! It won't shoot! It's jammed! Bunchuk ran along the line to the disabled gun. When still a little way off, he saw Anna on her knees at its side, staring under her palm at the advancing enemy chain. Lie down, he shouted, his face darkening with fear for her. Lie down, I tell you! She glanced at him and continued to kneel. Curses as heavy as stones fell from his lips. He ran up to her and flung her forcibly to the ground. Krutogorov was squeezing by the shield. It's had enough, it won't work, he muttered to Bunchuk, and looking round for Gevorkyans, burst into a shout. He's run away, damn him! Your antediluvian monster has run away! He's completely upset me with his groans. He wouldn't let a man work properly! Gevorkyans crawled up, writhing like a serpent, mud clinging to the black scrub of his beard. Krutogorov stared at him for a moment, then howled above the roar of the firing. What have you done with the ammunition belts, you animal? Bunchuk, take him away or I shall kill him. Bunchuk examined the machine gun. A bullet struck hard against the shield, and he removed his hand as though burnt. He put the gun in order, and himself directed the firing, forcing the oncoming Alexeyev men to lie down. Then he crawled away, looking for cover. The chains of the enemy drew closer. Their fire grew heavier. In the Red Guard ranks, three men were hit, and their comrades took their rifles and cartridges. Dead men have no need of weapons. Right in the eyes of Anna and Bunchuk as they lay at the side of Krutogorov's gun, a young Red Guard was struck by a bullet. He writhed and groaned, digging into the earth with his feet, and finally raising himself on his hands, coughed and gasped in air for the last time. Bunchuk glanced sidelong at Anna. A fleeting terror lurked in her great dilated eyes as she stared unwinkingly at the feet of the dead lad, not hearing Krutogorov's shout, A belt! A belt! Girl, give me a fresh belt! By a deep flanking movement, the Kalyadin troops pushed the Red Guard ranks back. The black greatcoats and tunics of the retreating workers began to dribble through the streets of the suburb. The machine gun on the extreme right fell into the hands of the whites. The Greek Mikhalidze was shot down by a Junker. A second gunner was transfixed with bayonets, and only the compositor Stepanov managed to escape. The retreat was halted when the first shells began to fly from the red trawlers in the port. The red guards hesitated and turned, then advanced into the attack. Bunchuk had gathered Anna, Krutogorov, and Gevorkyans around him. Suddenly Krutogorov pointed to a distant fence with little gray human figures assembled behind it. There they are, he shouted. Bunchuk swung the gun round in that direction. Anna sat down and saw all movement die away behind the fence. After a moment the whites opened a measured fire, and the bullets sped over them, tearing invisible holes in the misty canvas of the sky. The belt rattled like a kettle drum as it ran through the machine gun, the shells fired by the Black Sea Fleet sailors in the trawlers went screaming overhead. The sailors had now got the range and were carrying on a concentrated fire. Isolated groups of the retreating Kalyadin troops were covered by the bursting shrapnel. One of the shells burst right in the midst of one group, and the brown column of the explosion scattered the men in all directions. Anna dropped her field glasses and groaned, covering her terror-stricken eyes with dirty palms. What's the matter? Bunchuk shouted, bending towards her. She compressed her lips and her dilated eyes glazed. I can't. Be brave. You, Anna, do you hear? Do you hear? You mustn't do that. You mustn't. The authoritative voice of command beat at her ear. On the right flank, some of the enemy had gathered in a valley and on the slopes of a rise. Bunchuk noticed them, ran with the machine gun to a more convenient spot and opened fire on the valley. Towards evening, a first fine snow began to whirl down over the harsh earth. Within an hour, the wet, sticky snow had completely enveloped the field and the muddy black bundles of the dead. The Kalyadin troops withdrew. Bunchuk spent the night in the machine-gun outpost. 
Krutogorov chewed away at some stringy meat, spitting and cursing. Huddled in the gateway of a yard, Gevorkyans warmed his blue hands over a cigarette. Bunchuk sat on an ammunition case, wrapping the trembling Anna in his greatcoat, tearing her damp hands from her eyes and kissing them. The words of unaccustomed tenderness came with difficulty from his lips. Now, now, how could you take on so? You were hard. Anna, listen, take yourself in hand. Anna, dear, you'll get used to it. If your pride will not allow you to go back, you must be different. You can't look on the dead like that. Don't let your thoughts turn that way. Take them in hand. You see now, although you said you were brave, the woman in you has won. Anna was silent. Her hands smelt of the wintry earth and of womanly warmth. The falling snow concealed the sky in a dense, gracious blanket. The yard, the fields, the town, lurking like a beast in the darkness, were wrapped in drowsy slumber. Six days the struggle continued around and in Rostov. Fighting went on in the streets and at the crossroads. Twice the Red Guards surrendered the station, and twice they drove the enemy out again. During those six days, there were no prisoners taken by either side. Late one afternoon, Bunchuk and Anna were passing the goods station and saw two Red Guards shoot a captured officer. Bunchuk said almost challengingly to Anna, who had turned away, That's sensible. They must be killed, wiped out without mercy. They show us no mercy, and we don't ask for it. So why should we show them mercy? This filth must be raked off the earth. There can be no sentimentality once it is a question of the fate of the revolution. Those workers are right. On the third day of the struggle, he was taken ill. But he kept on his feet for some days, feeling a continually increasing nausea and weakness in all his body. His head rang and was unbearably heavy. The Red Guard detachments abandoned the town at dawn on December 15th. Bunchuk, supported by Anna and Krutogorov, walked behind a wagon containing wounded and a machine gun. He bore his helpless body along with the utmost difficulty, put forward his iron-heavy feet as though asleep, and heard Anna say from a great distance off, Get into the wagon, Ilya. Do you hear? Do you understand what I say? I ask you to get in. You're ill. But he did not understand her words, nor did he understand that he was broken and in the grip of typhus. He clutched his head and pressed his hairy hands to his burning, flaming face. He felt as though blood were dripping from his eyes, and all the world, boundless and unstable, cut off from him by an invisible curtain, were rearing and tearing under his feet. In his delirium, his imagination began to conjure up incredible visions. He stopped again and again, struggling with Krutogorov, who was trying to put him into the wagon. No, wait, who are you? Where's Anna? Give me a bit of earth and destroy these. I order you to turn the machine gun on them. Stop! It's hot! He shouted hoarsely, tearing his hand from Anna's grip. They lifted him forcibly into the wagon. For a moment more, he could smell a pungent mixture of various scents. He saw a chaotic confusion of color effects and struggled fearfully to retain command of himself, but he could not. A black, soundless emptiness closed over him. Only somewhere in the height burned a point of opal and azure blue, and zigzags and fires of ruddy lightning intercrossed before his eyes. Chapter 2 the icicles were falling from the cornices and shattering with a glassy tinkle. In the village, the thaw blossomed into pools and denuded earth. The cattle went wandering with sniffing nostrils along the streets. The sparrows chattered as though it were springtime as they pecked among the heaps of brushwood in the yards. Martin Shamil chased across the square after a sorrel horse that had escaped from his stable. Its stringy tail raised high, its unkempt mane tossing in the wind, it bucked and sent the clods of half-melted snow flying from its hoofs, circled round the square, halted by the church wall, and sniffed at the bricks. It allowed its master to get fairly close, glanced askance at the bridle in his hand, and broke again into a gallop. 
January was caressing the earth with warm, cloudy days. The Cossacks watched the dawn in expectation of a premature flood. Miran Korshinov stood in his backyard, staring at the snow deep on the fields, at the icy gray-green of the dawn, and thought, it's piling up this year just like it did last. Snow, snow, nothing but snow. I fear the earth will be heavy underneath. Mitka, in a khaki tunic, was cleaning out the cattle yard. His white fur cap stuck to the back of his head by a miracle. His straight hair, dank with sweat, fell over his brow, and he brushed it back with his dirty, smelly palm. A heap of frozen cattle dung lay by the gate, and a fluffy goat was treading over it. The sheep were huddled against the fence. A lamb, bigger than its mother, tried to suck at her, but she put her head down and drove it off. A ring-horned black sheep was scratching itself against a plow. Miran went to the threshing floor, and with professional eyes estimated the quantity of hay still left. He began to rake together some millet straw scattered about by the goats, but unfamiliar voices reached his ears. He threw the rake onto the pile and went into the yard. His feet planted apart, Mitka was standing, rolling a cigarette, holding his richly embroidered pouch, the gift of some village sweetheart, in two fingers. With him were Kristonia and Ivan Alexievich. Kristonia was pulling some cigarette paper out of his cap. Ivan Alexievich was leaning against the fence, rummaging in his trouser pockets. His clean-shaven face wore a look of vexation. Evidently, he had forgotten something. Had a good night, Miran Grigorievich? Kristonia greeted him. Praise be. Come and join us in a smoke. No, I've just had one. Miran shook hands with the Cossacks, removed his three-cornered cap from his head, stroked his bristly white hair, and smiled. And what may you be wanting with us today, brothers, he asked. Christonia looked him up and down, but did not reply at once. He spat on his paper, slowly drew his great rough tongue over it, and after rolling the cigarette replied, We've got business with Mitka. Grandad Grishaka passed by, carrying a fishing net over his shoulder. Ivan and Christonia took off their caps and greeted him. He carried the net to the steps and then turned back. Why are you stopping at home, soldiers, having too good a time with your wives? he asked. Why, what's up? Christonia inquired. Shut up, Christonia. Don't tell me you don't know. God's truth, I don't know, Christonia replied. By the cross, I don't, old dad. A man arrived the other day from Varanyej, a merchant, a friend or relation or something of Sergei Mokhov. I don't know exactly. Well, he comes and says that strange soldiers, the Bolsheks themselves, are at Chertkov. Russia is going to make war on us. And you're staying at home, you scum. Do you hear, Mitka? Haven't you anything to say? What do you think about it? We don't think at all about it, Ivan Alexievich smiled. That's the shame that you don't think, old Grishaka waxed indignant. They'll take you in a snare like partridges. The peasants will take you prisoners and smash your snouts. Miran Grigorievich smiled discreetly. Kristonia rasped his hand over his long, unshaven cheeks. Ivan Alexievich stood smoking and looking at Mitka, and little fires sparkled in Mitka's eyes. It was impossible to judge whether he were laughing or burning with repressed annoyance. After a little more talk, Ivan Alexievich and Kristonia took their leave of Miran and called Mitka to the wicket gate. Why didn't you come to the meeting yesterday? Ivan sternly asked. I hadn't time, but you had time to go along to the Mielyakovs. With a jerk of his head, Mitka brought his cap down over his forehead and said with restrained anger, I didn't come, and that's all there is to it. Why should we waste time talking about it? All the men from the front in the village were there except you and Pyotr Mielikov. We've decided to send delegates from the village to Kamenska. There is to be a congress of front-line men there on January 23rd. We cast dice, and it was settled that I, Kristonia, and you should go. I'm not going, Mitka announced resolutely. What's your game? Kristonia frowned and took him by the button of his tunic. Are you breaking away from your own comrades? He's hand in glove with Pyotr Melyakov, Ivan Alexievich said. 
He shook the sleeve of Cristonia's jacket and added, turning noticeably pale, Come on, there's nothing we can do here. So you won't go, Mitri? No, I've said no, and I mean no. With eyes averted, Mitka stretched out his hand and said goodbye, then turned and went to the kitchen. The snake, Ivan Alexeyevich muttered, and his nostrils quivered. The snake, he said aloud, staring at Mitka's back. On their way home, they informed some of the front-line men that Mitka had refused to go, and that the two of them would set out the following day for the Congress. They left Tatarsk at dawn on January 21st. Yakob Padkova had volunteered to drive them to Kamienska. His pair of good horses drew them swiftly out of the village and up the slope. The thaw had laid the road bare, and where the snow had melted, the sledge runners stuck to the earth, the sledge jerked along, and the horses strained at the traces. The Cossacks walked behind the sledge. Red with the light morning breeze, Podkova strode along, his boots scrunching the fine ice. Kristonia panted up the hill over the granular snow at the roadside, gasping because of the German poison gas he had drawn into his lungs at Dubno in 1916. At the hilltop, the wind was stronger and the air keener. The Cossacks were silent. Ivan Alexeyevich wrapped his face in the collar of his sheepskin. They drew near to a wood, through which the road pierced to emerge onto a mounded ridge. The wind rippled in streams through the wood. The trunks of the sappy oaks were stained with scaly layers of gold-green rust. A magpie chattered in the distance, and it fluttered across the road. The wind was carrying it out of its course, and it flew violently, lopsidedly, its pied feathers ruffling. Podkova, who had not said a word since leaving the village, turned to Ivan Alexeyevich and remarked deliberately, evidently giving voice to thoughts long pondered, At the Congress, work for things to be arranged without war. There'll be no volunteers for a war. Of course, Christonia agreed enviously staring after the magpie's free flight, and mentally comparing the bird's thoughtlessly happy life with human existence. They arrived at Kamienska in the early evening of the 23rd. Crowds of Cossacks were making their way through the streets towards the center of the town. There was a noticeable animation everywhere. Ivan and Kristonia sought out the quarters of Gregor Melyakov, but learnt that he was not at home. The mistress of the house, an elderly, white-haired woman, informed them that he had gone to the Congress. When they arrived, they found the Congress in full swing. The great many-windowed room could hardly hold all the delegates, and many of the Cossacks were crowded on the stairs, in the corridors, and in adjacent rooms. "'Hold on behind me,' Christonia whispered to Ivan, working his elbows vigorously. Ivan followed in the narrow cleft he made. The Cossacks smiled and stared with involuntary respect at Christonia, who was a good head taller than any of them. They found Grigor by the wall at the back. He was squatting, smoking, and talking to another delegate. When he saw his fellow villagers, his raven whiskers quivered with his smile. Why, what wind has blown you here? Hello, Ivan Alexeyevich. How are you, Daddy Christonia? he exclaimed. Not too bad, Christonia laughed back, gathering all Gregor's hand in his own great fist. And how is everybody in the village? All well. They sent their greetings. Your father has sent you orders to come and visit them. And how's Pyotr? Pyotr, Ivan Alexeyevich smiled awkwardly. Pyotr doesn't mix with us. I know. And how's Natalia and the children? Did you happen to see them? All well, and they send their greetings. As he talked, Christonia stared at the group sitting behind the table on the platform. Even from the back he could see better than anyone else. Gregor continued to ply them with questions, taking advantage of a momentary break in the session. Ivan Alexeyevich gave him the news of the village, and briefly told him of the front-line men's meeting, which had sent them to Kamienska. He, in turn, began to inquire about events in Kamienska, but someone sitting at the table shouted, Cossacks! A delegate from the miners will now speak. I ask you to listen carefully to him and to keep order. A thick-lipped man of average height stroked his fair hair back and began to speak. The hum of voices died away at once. 
From the very first words of the miner's burning, passionate speech, Grigor and the other Cossacks came under the spell of his convincing eloquence. He spoke of the treacherous policy of Kalyedin, who was driving the Cossacks into a war against the workers and peasants of Russia, of the common interest of the Cossacks and the workers, of the aims of the Bolsheviks, who were carrying on a struggle against the Cossack counter-revolutionaries. We stretch out our brotherly hands to the toiling Cossacks and hope that in the struggle against the White Guard bands we shall find faithful allies among the front-line Cossacks, his trumpet voice thundered. At the fronts of the Tsarist Russian-German War, the workers and Cossacks jointly poured out their blood. And in the war against the nests of the bourgeoisie, we must stand together. And we shall stand together. Hand in hand we shall go into the struggle against those who have enslaved the toilers for many centuries. That's right. Aye, that's right, Ivan Alexeyevich muttered again and again as he listened with half-open mouth. After other speakers, a delegate from the 44th Regiment stood up. He was burdened with his own clumsy, involved phrases and found it as difficult to make a speech as to set a mark on the air. But the Cossacks listened to him with great sympathy, only rarely interrupting with approving cries. Evidently, his words found a vivid response among them. Brothers, we must take our Congress to this serious business so that it should not be shameful to the people and so that everything should end quietly and well. What I mean is that we must find a way out without a bloody war. As it is, we've had three and a half years of being buried in the trenches, and if we've got to go on fighting, the Cossacks will be worn to death. That's true. We don't want war. We must talk it over with the Bolsheviks and the military council. The chairman, Podchelkov, thundered on the table with his fist, and the roar died away. The delegate of the 44th Regiment went on. We must send delegates to Novacherkass and ask the volunteers and the partisans to clear out of here. And the Bolsheviks also haven't anything to do here either. We can settle with the enemies of the working people ourselves. We don't need other people's help from anyone. And if we do need it, we'll ask them to give us help. Lagutin, the Cossack who had been in Lisnitsky's regiment, followed the delegate of the 44th Regiment with a challengingly fiery speech. He was frequently interrupted with shouts. The proposal was made to suspend the meeting for ten minutes, but as soon as silence was established, Podtyelkov shouted to the excited crowd of Cossacks, Brother Cossacks, here we are arguing and discussing but the enemy of the toiling people is not asleep. We would all like the wolves to be full and the sheep whole, but that isn't what Kalyedin thinks. We have captured a copy of an order signed by him for all those taking part in this Congress to be arrested. I will read it aloud. As he read the order, a wave of agitation ran through the delegates, and a tumult arose still greater than before. At last the roar of voices sank and from the platform the Cossack Krivoshlikov's girlishly thin tones pierced through the growing lull. Down with Kalyedin! Hurrah for the Cossack military revolutionary Soviet! The crowd groaned. In the heavy, lashing braid of sound, cries of approval were to be heard. Krivoshlikov remained standing with upraised hand. His fingers were trembling a little, like the leaves of an aspen. Hardly had the deafening roar subsided when he cried in the same thin, flowing voice, I propose that we elect a Cossack military revolutionary committee from among the delegates present, and that it be instructed to carry on the struggle against Kalyedin and the organs of... Ha! A shout like a bursting shell arose, sending flakes of whitewash from the ceiling. The meeting at once began to elect the members of the committee. A small section of the Cossacks, led by the delegate of the 44th Regiment and others, continued to call for a peaceful settlement of the conflict with the Kalyedin government. But the majority no longer supported them. The Cossacks had been enraged by Kalyedin's order for their arrest and demanded active resistance to him. Grigor did not stay to the end of the election, as he was summoned urgently to the regimental staff, as he turned to go out, he asked Christonia and Ivan, When it's over, come along to my room. 
I shall be curious to know who is elected. Ivan Alexeyevich turned up after nightfall. Patsyalkov is chairman, Krivoshlikov secretary, he informed Grigor as he stood on the threshold. And the members? Ivan Lagutin and Galavachev, Minayev, Kudinov, and some others. But where is Christonia? Grigor asked. He went with several other Cossacks to arrest the Kamienska authorities. He got all worked up, and I couldn't stop him. Christonia did not return till dawn. He stood in the room, breathing heavily and mumbling something under his voice. Grigor lit the lamp and noticed that his face was bloody, and a gunshot scratch ran across his forehead. Who did that to you? Shall I tie it up? Wait a moment, I'll find a bandage. Grigor jumped up and turned out his first aid kit. It'll heal quickly enough, like a dog does, Christonia rumbled. The military commander fired at me with his pistol. We went along to him like guests, with all due respect, and he tried to defend himself. He wounded another Cossack, too. I wanted to drag the soul out of him to see what an officer's soul is like, but the other Cossacks wouldn't let me, or I'd have given him a good time. Grigor's friend, Lieutenant Izvarin, fled from his regiment just before the Congress of Frontline Cossacks was held at Kamienska. The night before he left, he visited Grigor and hinted vaguely at the step he was about to take. I find it difficult to serve in the regiment in the present situation, he said. The Cossacks are wavering between two extremes, the Bolsheviks and the former monarchic system. No one wishes to support Kalyadin's government, if only because he is behaving like a child with a new toy. What we want is a firm, resolute man who will put the foreigners in their proper place. But I think it is better to support Kalyadin at the moment, otherwise we shall lose the game entirely. After a silence during which he lit a cigarette, he asked, I gather you have accepted the red faith? Almost, Grigor assented. Sincerely? Or are you like Golubov, out to get popular with the Cossacks? I'm not in need of popularity. I am myself seeking a way out. You're in a blind alley, and you haven't found a way out. We shall see. I'm afraid we shall meet as enemies, Grigor. No enemies are friends on the field of battle, Grigor smiled. Izvarin sat talking a little while longer, then departed. Next morning he had disappeared like a stone into water. The next day, the 10th Don Cossack Regiment, sent by Kalyedin to arrest all the members of the Congress and to disarm the most revolutionary of the Cossack divisions, arrived at Kamienska, detraining just as a meeting was being held at the station. The newly arrived Cossacks crowded around the meeting and mingled with the men of other regiments. The yeast of the vigorous agitation which the Bolshevik adherents at once began among them worked quickly, and when the regimental commander called on them to carry out Kalyadin's orders, they refused. Meantime, Kamienska was feverish with activity. Hurriedly assembled divisions of Cossacks were being sent out to occupy stations. Troop trains were being dispatched. Elections of officers were taking place in the detachments. The Cossacks, anxious to avoid war, slipped quietly out of the town, while belated delegates from various villages were still arriving. Never before had the Kamenska streets been so animated. On January 26th, a delegation from the Don military government arrived in the town to open negotiations. A large crowd met it at the station. An escort of Cossacks from the Ottoman's lifeguard regiment conducted it to the post office building, where the Military Revolutionary Committee spent most of the night in session with the government delegation. The conference failed to reach any settlement. About two o'clock in the morning, when it was evident that no agreement could be achieved, a member of the delegation proposed that the Military Revolutionary Committee should send a delegation to Novacherkass in order to come to some final decision on the issue of the future government. The proposal was adopted. The Dawn government delegation departed, and the representatives of the Military Revolutionary Committee set out immediately after it for Novicherkas. Podzielkov was at their head. The officers of the Ottomans regiment who had been arrested in Kamienska were held as hostages. A snowstorm was raging outside the carriage windows. Wind-driven snowdrifts were visible above the half-ruined snow fences. 
the railway cabins, the telegraph poles, and all the illimitable, dreary, snowy monotony of the steppe sped away to the north. The compartment was foggy with tobacco smoke and cold. The members of the delegation felt by no means confident of their mission to Novicherkas. They talked but little, and the silence was dreary. At last, Podchelkov expressed the general conviction. Nothing will come of it. We shan't agree. Again they sat silent. They drew near to Novicherkas. Minayev began to relate. When in the old days the Cossacks of the Ottoman regiment had served their time, they were equipped to return home. They'd load their chests, their horses and goods into the train. The train would set out, and just by Varanej, where the line crosses the dawn for the first time, the engine driver would go slowly, as slowly as possible. He knew what was coming. And as soon as the train got onto the bridge, my grandfathers, what a scene. The Cossacks would go quite mad. The dawn, the dawn, the gentle dawn, our father, giver of our food, hurrah! And through the window, over the bridge, straight into the water, would go caps, old tunics, trousers, shirts, and the Lord knows what else. They would give presents to the dawn on their return from service. Sometimes, as you looked at the water, you would see blue ottoman caps floating like swans or flowers. It was a very old custom. The train reduced speed and finally stopped. The Cossacks rose. As he buttoned his tunic, Krivoshlikov said with a wry smile, Well, here we are, at home. They're not giving their guests a very hospitable welcome, Skotchkov tried to jest. A tall captain threw open the door without knocking and entered the compartment. He surveyed the members of the delegation with eyes expressive of his hostility, and said with deliberate roughness, I have been instructed to accompany you. Please leave the carriage as quickly as possible, Mr. Bolsheviks. I cannot guarantee the crowd and your safety. There they are, the scoundrels, the betrayers of the Cossacks, a long-whiskered officer standing among the crowd on the platform shouted as they got out. Podchelkov turned pale and glanced back at Krivoshlikov with disconcerted eyes. A strong escort of officers guarded the delegation. To the very door of the government headquarters they were accompanied by a frenzied crowd demanding that they should be lynched on the spot. Not only officers and yunkers, but elegantly dressed women and students, and even a few Cossacks hurled abuse at them. The hall of the government administration was not large enough to accommodate all the crowd that had gathered. While the members of the delegation were seating themselves on one side of a table, the members of the government arrived. Accompanied by Bagayevsky, Kalyedin, stooping slightly, approached the table with a firm, wolfish stride. He pulled back his chair and sat down, setting his cap with its officer's cockade calmly on the table, brushing back his hair and buttoning up the great side pocket of his tunic. Then he bent towards Bagayevsky and whispered something to him. His every movement and gesture was expressive of resolute, deliberate confidence, of mature strength. Bagayevsky seemed more agitated in face of the coming negotiations. He sat whispering, hardly moving his lips, his slanting eyes glittering behind his pince-nez. He betrayed his nervousness by restless movements of his hands, adjusting his collar, feeling his chin, and raising his eyebrows. The rest of the government delegates seated themselves on either side of Kalyedin, and the general stared across at Podchelkov opposite him and said, I think we can begin. Podchelkov smiled, and speaking in audible tones, stated the reasons for the arrival of the delegation. Krivoshlikov picked up the ultimatum prepared by the Military Revolutionary Committee and stretched it across the table. But Kalyedin rejected it with a movement of his white hand and said firmly, There is no point in wasting time while every member of the government separately studies the document. Please to read your ultimatum aloud. Then we shall discuss it. Krivoshlikov stood up. His girlishly thin voice flowed indistinctly through the crowded hall as he read the committee's demand for the abdication of the military ottoman and his government. Hardly had his voice died away when Kalyedin loudly asked, What troops have given you authority for this ultimatum? Podchelkov exchanged glances with Krivoshlikov and began to calculate. The ottoman lifeguards, 
the Cossack lifeguards, the 6th and 32nd batteries, the 44th regiment. As he mentioned each division, he bent down the fingers of his left hand, and a jeering titter ran through the hall. He frowned, set his hairy hands down on the table, and raised his voice. The 28th Regiment, the 28th Battery, the 27th Regiment, the 14th Regiment. When he had finished, Kalyedin asked a few unimportant questions. Then, pressing his chest against the edge of the table, he stared at Podtyalkov and demanded, Do you recognize the authority of the Soviet of People's Commissars? Podtyalkov gulped down a glass of water, set the glass back on the table, wiped his whiskers with his sleeve, and replied evasively, Only all the people can reply to that. Afraid that the more simple Podtyalkov might say too much, Krivoshlikov intervened. The Cossacks will not condemn any government in which there are representatives of the parties of national freedom. But we are Cossacks, and the government should be our own Cossack government. <laughs>